Anyway, I believe in you. Thank you. Go. Be careful. I love you. For many moviegoers, 2023 will be remembered as the year of Barbenheimer, that momentous occasion that culminated when Greta Gerwig's Barbie and Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer opened on the same day in July. It was a meme-filled, pundit-ready celebration of the movies as two seemingly polar opposite cinematic experiences collided, a sort of A-bomb of celluloid fueled by dream houses and existential crises instead of uranium. But there was much more to the year 2023 at the movies beyond those two films. From prestige picks to action, horror, animation, and beyond. Here are our nominations for the best movie of 2023. When I came to you with those calculations, we thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. Yeah. The thing about Barbenheimer that was so remarkable was that it felt like a true boost for the movie-going experience in the wake of the pandemic. And in a time where audiences seem to increasingly be choosing to stay home and stream rather than go to the movies. But it was also a tumultuous year for Hollywood, with the Actors and Writers Guild each going on strike for months on end. Not even Barbenheimer could mitigate the impact of the strikes. And while both labor disputes have since been resolved, the production pipeline for most major movies and TV shows was impacted. That includes the release schedule for a variety of titles that now won't hit until 2024, like June Part 2. Still, there is plenty to celebrate from the past 12 months of movies. Let's start with Wes Anderson, the filmmaker's latest idiosyncratic live-action postcard, Asteroid City. Schubert Green lived in the scenic bay of the Tarkington Theatre for all 785 performances of Asteroid City. Featuring Anderson's ever-growing repertory troupe of name actors, but kind of starring Scarlett Johansson and Jason Schwartzman, the film nests various perspectives on the same story, Russian doll style. Unfolding simultaneously is a 1950s black and white television production, a stage show about a trip to the desert town of the same title, and a full color movie version of that show. In the latter, a stop motion alien showing up is just as natural as the Looney Tunes-esque setting, and back to weird caricatures that are standard operating procedure for the filmmaker. Asteroid City is Anderson fully immersed in his unique toy box, and you're either into it or you're not at this point. And speaking of toys... I'm Alan. I'm, uh, I'm Ken's buddy. Yeah, all his clothes fit me! During its long gestation period, a Barbie movie always seemed like a joke. And certainly movies based on toys haven't had the greatest track record, but nobody counted on the combined powers of star-slash-producer Margot Robbie, director-slash-co-writer Greta Gerwig, and co-writer Noah Baumbach, who decided to use the iconic children's doll to explore the complexities of not just womanhood in the 21st century, but also manhood, while doing so in a hilarious and brightly designed world. One of the reasons why Barbie worked so well and was a hit was that while, sure, it's a smart movie that offers a lot to think about, you could also just take your kids to see it and they'll enjoy it as much as the adults. Just so you know, the actor wasn't personal. Now maybe a little bit. Perhaps not quite as kid-friendly was the culmination of Baba Yaga's story with John Wick Chapter 4, an epic action movie that clocks in at around 2 hours and 50 minutes. One might wonder how many headshots a viewer can watch before getting bored. It turns out the answer is... Well, we still don't know, because there's nothing boring about the fourth and maybe, but probably not last installment of the Keanu Reeves series. New villain Bill Skarsgård is a formidable opponent to John Wick this time out, but it's Donnie Yen's turn as the blind assassin Kane, another old friend of John's, that is a high point of the film. The front is the front, the back is the back! He has to make it look like he's done himself! Based on the book by David Gran about a series of murders of Osage Native Americans in the early part of the 20th century, Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon brings back his two muses, Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro, for a film that may outwardly seem unlike the famed director's typical oeuvre. But once you immerse yourself in Killer's almost three and a half hour long running time, those old Scorsese themes of blood and money and blood money make themselves clear. Who cares what Marty has to say about Marvel when he's still speaking through films like this? One doubts that Robert Downey Jr. cares to talk about Marvel much himself lately, having co-starred in Oppenheimer. Oh dear, you haven't heard. 
Christopher Nolan's more than just a biopic about the so-called father of the atomic bomb. While Killian Murphy finally takes center stage in a Nolan film as the title character, Downey Jr. serves as a memorable foil to the star as Louis Strauss a member of the US Atomic Energy Commission who has a complicated relationship with Oppenheimer. The film's Trinity test sequence depicting the first atomic blast is a sight to behold in and of itself, and Oppenheimer's constant sense of tension is unnerving while simultaneously fascinating, like looking at the atomic version of a car wreck in slow motion. Miles Morales and Gwen Stacy and Peter B. Parker return for Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, a sequel that is somehow even more amazingly designed than the first film. I mean, just look at that opening sequence where Gwen fights a Renaissance version of the Vulture. Of course, that's just the beginning for this middle film in the planned trilogy, as everything gets bigger and more complicated for our heroes, including the arrival of Oscar Isaac's Maybe He's Good, But Maybe He's Bad Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2019. That and the film ending rather abruptly on a cliffhanger is a little bit off-putting, but hey, it worked for The Empire Strikes Back, didn't it? Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Talk to me. Did I mention endings? Filmmakers Danny and Michael Filippo, also known as YouTube creators Raka Raka, made their feature debut with Talk To Me, a story of what happens when you mess with shit that you shouldn't. It's a tale as old as time, as Mrs. Potts would say. Tale as old as time, song as old as rhyme. May I have my foot in your mouth? What? No, I didn't. As Sophie Wilde's Mia gets involved with some supernatural shenanigans that allows her and her friends to commune with spirits from beyond. From there, the Filippo brothers convey an increasingly out of control story as the characters dig themselves deeper and deeper before things culminate in one of the most memorable, in a good way, if horrific way, final on screen moments of the year. There are other movies from 2023 that the IGN team wanted to acknowledge as among our favorites of the year, even though we know they're unlikely to take the top prize home when all is said and done. Poor Things, from director Yorgos Lanthimos and starring Emma Stone, hasn't been widely screened at the time of this writing, but its Frankenstein-esque tale of rebirth has wowed us. Director Adele Lim's road trip comedy Joyride is raunchy fun, while Studio Ghibli's The Boy and the Heron marks the return of the animation legend Hayao Miyazaki and is a must for any fan of the form. But what have been your favorite films of 2023? Let's discuss in the comments. And for more on the IGN 2023 awards, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel.